Good Friday morning, everybody. This is Stephen Ramsden. We are live on Facebook on the Sunlit Earth page and the Georgia Audubon page. And this is This Week in Birding and Nature Photography on Sunlit Earth. We have a great show this week. Uh, as always, we try to have the best show possible. And we are going to be discussing some local sightings this week. Um, we're going to talk about some really cool things going on, on in the iPhone and smartphone app world. And then we're going to have a very special guest, Mary Kimberly, who's already with us. Hey, Mary. Hey there. <laughs> and she is going to educate me on some burden and Project Safe Flight, which I'm not uh, all that familiar with. Um, I have had some, some time on it, but she's going to tell us all the details and tell us what an incredible program that is and maybe help some of us uh, get more involved with it. So I'm going to switch over to my um, not so ugly face view and then we are going to get with it. So Mary, if you'll stand by with us for a couple minutes, um, I'm going to go over some cool things that have happened this week. Um, Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. That's right. Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. 28 acres of beauty right here in, in uh, Decatur, uh, six miles east of my house and um, a place where I help manage and, and maintain the property and, and encourage uh, birding and, and nature hikes it is on fire right now with birds so fall migration is in full swing we have seen some incredible sights there this week and you can tell when when Clyde Shepherd's hopping because every birder on earth is over there because it's so close and easy to get to you know you don't have to drive very far to get quality birds so let me show you uh this photo the uh the main thing that's going on, welcome Alexandra Hart. Um, Mary Alexandra is a friend of mine from the UK and we are solar astronomy buddies and she's also an avid naturalist. So she's gonna be on with us and may chime in and say something, I'm not sure. Um, this beautiful bird is called an American bittern. Um, I could talk forever about this bird because I really, really like this bird. It's a, a wading bird, you know, similar in size to maybe a yellow crown night heron. Uh, or a little bit smaller than a great blue heron. But this bird walks around in the water, eats frogs, eats crawdads. And uh, it is very elusive, very, very, very difficult to find. Uh, it looks exactly like a clump of dried grass, unless it's moving. And I sat there yesterday morning after uh, Dan Vickers and his friends found this bird a couple of days ago, uh, right there in the pond, you know, 10 feet away from the, from the observation deck, just like it was a couple of years ago. Um, I stared at this spot of dried grass for at least an hour and a half while I was scanning around and um, I go, nah, that's not, a, that's not it. And then I looked at it close up in my camera several times and uh, it was frozen and I said, ah, no, that's not it, that's not it. And then Wes Hatch walks up and Adam Betch will walk up and within 10 seconds, Wes goes, hey, there it is right there. And it was the clump I was looking at and it got up and started walking. So that's how hard these birds are to see. So it's putting on a show and you will enjoy it. Uh, Clyde Shepherd has is, is got a website and it's got a Facebook page. So I, I highly suggest going over there and being very careful and quiet when you approach the area. But you'll probably see this bittern over the next few days because nobody's, none of the birds are moving right now because of the weather. Um, and I know Mary Kimberly is going to be over there looking at it at some point. And let's see what else we got. Mary um, is rednecked foul, foul rope, foul rope. Is that how you pronounce that? Fallerope. Fallerope, okay. Uh, Wes Hatch also and Larry Gridley and several other people uh, saw this bird, redneck fallerope. Uh, I know nothing about this bird except it's awesome and apparently it's pretty rare because eBird went crazy over it. Uh, have you ever seen this bird, Mary? Um, yes, but not in Georgia. Not in Georgia, okay. Well, I met Wes Hatch over at the Nature Preserve uh, yesterday, and you know, I, I don't didn't know him. I've never met him before, um, but he was telling me about seeing this bird, and then he was telling me all this crazy stuff about how you know I've seen his eBird reports a million times, and I've kind of based a lot of my trips on what he's reported, but I've never met him, and I was happy to finally meet him. Um, and he's telling me he had he's he's logged fifty birds plus in every single county in Georgia. 159 counties. And I'm thinking, man, what, what else do you do? I mean, it was like I was watching the movie, The Big Year, talking to uh, one of those dudes. That is some serious dedication. And we may have Wes, Wes on a uh, future show because he was a, certainly a nice guy. And um, Mary, have you met Wes before? 
Yes, I have. I yeah. know him. Mm, you know nice him. Guy. Okay. Go ahead. He's a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, very good. Very good I'll, bird. I'll tell you, um, when he walked up and saw the bird, the first thing he did was alert everyone around him and say, if you guys are looking for the bitter and here it is. And he showed several people came up and couldn't find it. And he helped each person find it. And I thought that was really cool. And uh, that's something that, that I really like doing. When he found the American bitter, not the foul, the foul your rope. Foul your rope. Foul a rope. Foul a rope. Hear that P? I wonder where that word came from. That sounds like a, a Roman or Greek origin. It probably means waiting bird. You know, a lot of these bird names like bittern and heron just translate to water bird. Yeah, they, <laughs> they swim around in circles. Yeah. Really? But he found that down the coast, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. So they swim around in circles. So that so there's kind of like me when I was an air traffic controller, because that's pretty much when I still had a job. And I know that you're a, a, a retired or are you retired? Um, chemist? Yes, I, I'm a retired uh, chemist. I used to work at the CDC. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I loved chemistry in school and I was really an oddball for that. I couldn't wait to get to chemistry and physics class. Um, that stuff just makes perfect sense to me. And I speak chemistry. So um, I was happy to hear someone else, I think, mentioned to me that you were a retired CDC chemist. And I said, that's really cool. Doctorate holding chemist on my show, man. I am so legit. But um, <laughs> <clears throat> so the other birds that were reported here locally, uh, well, maybe not locally, but in the state of Georgia that kind of uh, piqued my interest were the brown booby again at Lake Lanier. Uh, of course, the American bittern right here in my own nature preserve. Um, some of these flycatchers, sedge wren and marsh wren, are both also at, um, wait a minute, Dottie just sent me a text message. Dottie Head from Georgia Audubon. Welcome, Georgia Audubon viewers. Um, I can't tell you how much work Dottie Head puts into putting on all this live content. Mary will tell you it's, it, it's a uh, struggle every single time you try to do these things because something always goes wrong. Uh, something's bad, something doesn't work, and you really got to be an IT guru to get through all this. Um, but Dottie does it, you know, all day long, every day for Georgia Audubon. So I really appreciate Dottie. Um, the sedge wren and the marsh wren, two birds that I've seen before, uh, and a Louisiana water thrush, I'm sorry, a northern water thrush, were reported at uh, Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. And also the Cape May warbler. You know, none of these birds are, you know, as rare as, say, the frigate bird or something, but they are really a treat for us local birders because we get to see something cool and different uh, at our own nature preserve. So I've seen Canada warblers reported locally. Um, Mary, have you had any super cool bird reported here this week that you've seen? Or do you have um, a, a, a chestnut sided warbler currently sitting on your windowsill? Is that what you're looking at? Uh, oh, I wish. <laughs> no, no. But uh, Henderson Park is good too. And we were over there um, earlier this week and I was over there late last week and it was hopping with uh, migrating warblers over near the dam. It was really, really great. So yeah. it's definitely the peak of fall migration right now. So it's time. We yeah. Agree. It's there time was, to get out there. There's also been some fly catchers over there. I tried to report one as a least, but I was corrected for that. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Bird splained, <laughs> as I call it. it. You were bird splained. Impets are really hard. <laughs> Impets are really hard. It was like an Acadian. Yeah. You know, I've stared at those many times and I, I just, I'm not good enough at it to know the difference. Um, and somebody like Kathy Miller or maybe you or George Ann can tell by the call or whatever, but. I, I can do some of the calls, but visually they're really hard. Um, well, being a retired air traffic controller and retired Navy uh, guy, I don't hear anything anymore. So if it's above a certain hertz, I'm not even going to hear it. These cedar wax wings, everybody will look up and say, oh, I don't hear a thing when they come by. So um, I have to rely on other people to tell me what's going on with the birds most of the time. I can see the raptors and the big birds, and I can see a bird if it moves. But I have a lot of problems seeing them, uh, especially the LBJs, the little brown jobs, unless they're moving. So we are going to uh, count on you to educate us a little bit on what's going on with this Project Safe Flight in just a minute. Um, and I was going to tell you also, the black-throated blues are very popular right now. Uh, of course, the yellow rumps are everywhere. Uh, my friend Josiah was telling me about a couple of Canada warblers that he spotted. And my friend Gina uh, Flanagan up in Rome, who lives very close to Barry College, uh, has seen a, um, man, I just forgot, a golden winged warbler in her mm. yard she's got a you know she just sits on the back deck with her coffee and like all these birds just fly up and pose for her 
and uh, it's remarkable how many how many birds she has in her yard. And you can see her photos on Sunlit Earth Facebook group as well as um, as the Georgia Wildlife Group, which are both groups that that uh, I'm involved with, and we try to promote birding for everyone. And just briefly, um, bef before we move on. Uh, Sunlit Earth is a, a registered nonprofit in the United States. It's actually a subsidiary of my main nonprofit, which is the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project. So that's what I mainly do around the world. And locally, Sunlit Earth is the terrestrial affiliate where we talk about wavelengths of light and how animals and plants use them in nature. And this is something uh, that Mary Kimberly uh, could explain even better than I could as far as the molecular boundaries of these bird wings and how the light interacts to these boundaries and reflects, refracts, diffracts different wavelengths towards your eye. And that blue on that blue jay is strictly caused by light that was created in the core of the sun, 93 million miles away, traveled through this hostile uh, inner solar system space, got into our atmosphere. Most of the wavelengths were filtered out the visible light that remains hits the molecular boundaries and structures of the atoms on the bird's feather. And some of it comes back into your eye of a certain wavelength and voila, you've got nature. Um, we, we see everything in nature solely because of this nuclear fusion in the core of our, our star. And that's a topic that fascinates me to no end. And I think about it all the time, uh, light. And that's kind of what Sunlit Earth talks about and also the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project. So we are a registered nonprofit and we encourage you to join our Sunlit Earth Facebook group and post what you love about sunlight. Um, I could talk to you for hours about it, but uh, I'm not gonna do that today. So, but I will do that individually to anyone who comes up to me in the woods. It's like the mushroom guy who knows every mushroom breed on earth that I met in the woods the other day. And he could have talked to me for six weeks about mushrooms. And I was totally fascinated. So uh, Mary Kimberly, uh, last uh, maybe two springs ago, I was walking down the Beltline and I saw, let me see if I can get this right. Just a moment. Uh oh, it's giving me some problems. What happened? What had happened? Hang on. Okay. And I saw just a moment. What did I see? I saw a Sora, my first Sora that I'd ever seen. And I have a picture of it here that I'm trying to bring up for you, but it's not cooperating. Wait a minute. There it is. Okay. Now, can I share that? I'll get right back to you. See, these are the kind of things that come up. <laughs> All right. Um, I've heard the soars and all that, and I was kind of new at birding. I'd just come over from astrophotography to bird photography, and I saw this soar laying on the ground. I didn't know what it was. It just looked cool, and the legs tipped me off immediately. And um, it was dead from apparently some kind of collision with uh, a window or a wall or something over on the belt line. And when that happened, uh, you know, I was, I was saddened by it because I'm, I'm at an age now where, where the death of anything saddens me, and I think about it more than I used to, you know maybe my own mortality, but this bird was just laying there and perfectly shaped and looked like it could just get up and walk away, but it had hit something and, and, and there it was. And it's a rare bird, you know, it's not a cardinal or something. It's something you would hardly ever see anywhere in the metro area. Um, so I asked a few questions, I called Adam Betchwell and he wanted me to, to freeze it and bring it to him. Um, but by, by that time though, someone had, had picked the bird up and, and put it in a Ziploc bag and stuck it in the freezer of the local coffee shop for some reason. So it was just a weird experience and, uh, you know, it kind of stuck with me. And then I started hearing a couple of things about Project Safe Flight. And uh, I think it's a great thing to do because, you know, we're killing enough animals and birds already. Um, I would really like to, to do anything to prevent more of these deaths. And uh, that's why I got trained to rescue raptors and reptiles and herons and try to do my part but what you're doing is really important for research as well so i'm going to um, ask you to first off tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and maybe what how long you've been birding that kind of thing and then let's go into what you're talking about mary i'm going to mute my microphone and just listen because i want to learn today well um i've been birding most of my adult life i guess but um um <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, when I was in graduate school at Emory and I met my husband um, there in the chemistry department, he, um, 
he came over to my apartment. I was in this little garage apartment over near Emory University. And um, my apartment looked out to the woods and we could see these little birds back in there. So he bought me this little bird feeder that suction cupped onto the side of uh, the outside of the window. And um, then we got a field guide and we started identifying the birds. And it just kind of, it kind of grew gradually for me. Um, I didn't uh, really, I mean, well, we started um, planning our vacations around places where we could go and see really cool birds. But we were, we were mainly just watching birds and I'd keep a list of the list of species and stuff, but I wasn't a serious lister. Right. And then- um, And that's Gavin, your husband, right? And he's also a retired chemist? He's also a retired chemist. Yes, wow. he he came from the industrial side, but I see. Um, or the corporate corporate. He worked for Kimberly Clark. I ah. Thank you for um, the wonderful paper products. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, in uh, around 2009, we went on a, a, a trip to Central America with. Um, a guy over in uh, South Carolina named Bill Hilton. He has this project called Operation Ruby Throat, and he used to run these trips to Central America to study ruby throated hummingbirds on in the wintering grounds. And at the beginning of that trip, he said, "Well, we'd like to have somebody on the trip who uh, will keep the list of birds we see. Who wants to do that?" And I said, "Okay, Unique. I'll do that." And that was kind of the beginning of me becoming a real serious lister, you know. Yeah. Um, and then when I retired in 2011, I spent the first six months of my retirement sitting in the chair here in the corner and playing Angry Birds on my iPad. And <laughs> after my my shoulder and neck seized up, I just thought, you know, I got to do something else. So I deleted Angry Birds from my iPad and signed up for Atlanta Audubon's now Georgia Audubon's Master Burger Program. Right, me too. I was in I was in the winter class of 2012, um, and so that's that's kind of how I got involved with uh, volunteering and working with Atlanta Audubon. Um, and then when Adam Betchwell came um, as our conservation director about four or four and a half years ago, he started um, Project Safe Flight. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> We're both wearing our Georgia Audubon t-shirts because we yeah. both took the Master Birders class and that's been a big influence on both of us. Yeah. Um, so uh, when Adam started um, Project Safe Flight, um, there had been uh, some precursor projects with that and I thought, there's no way I'm going to go and wander around downtown or Buckhead or anywhere and look <laughs> for dead birds. I mean, that just, that was like, I just can't do that. And I don't know, I don't know what shifted me on that, but I decided to, to sign on. Um, uh, and uh, I um, walked the, during spring and fall migration, um, my route is um, the Buckhead Loop. Um, we have a series of buildings. It's a regular walk that we check um, several times a week during uh, spring and fall migration. And when Gavin retired in 2017, he started doing it with me. Now, is this up by Tower Plaza and the Lenox Square area? Yes, right. right. Yeah. So there's a, a loop uh, in the Tower Place area, and then there's a loop that goes up Peachtree up to just north of Lenox Square and then comes uh, back. Yeah, because the there are some towering buildings up there that are really highly exposed, you know. Right, um, but it's not just the tall buildings. I mean, really? one of the worst buildings is only three stories high. Really? Um, if on our route, I mean, that we don't check every building in the area. That would just that would take hours and hours. Right, right. Um, but we do check. Um, Adam chose the buildings b based on different properties they had. Some that oh. are not landscaped. Some that are closely landscaped tall, short, because in a scientific study, you want to have, uh, you want to study every type of building uh, possible. So he chose that route based on different factors. Of, so do you um, mark the type of building as well when you're recording these things? That's, I never even yeah. thought of that. We use an app called um, Arc, ArcSys Collector um, and 
Um, it, um, it, it, it's um, geolocated, so we can mark where we are when we see the bird and uh, collect data about it. Is it alive? Is it dead? What species is it? Hmm. Um, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I never, I never thought about the type of building. And, you know, once you said that, and, you know, I'm, I'm infamous for interrupting my presenters, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I was getting my oil changed once in Alpharetta and this window on this Jiffy Lube. I just remembered this, just brought in my mind from what you're saying. And there was five or six dead grackles on the patio outside of this Jiffy Lube. And I thought that was really odd. And I asked the guy, this is before I knew much about it, you know, and I asked the guy and he said, yeah, they fly into the window every day or two. And they're just laying out there dead, you know. I was, well, that's really weird. But that makes perfect sense now. I, I didn't even think about a low, you know, a low building or, or something like that. But, you know, that's why we have you on to learn more. All right. Well, I have some pictures I can show um, if you're ready that. for that. Okay. Give me a minute here. Hope I can do this right. Mary Kimberly is an expert on all IT matters with her iPad. <laughs> we found over the last week of practicing and talking. And, um, all right. Okay. I'll exit out of this. I go there here. Go. There you go here. All right. So, um, can you see that? No. No. Why not? So are you on the iPad? I am on the iPad. Yeah. I did so it came did. up with some, with some window and you chose, you chose share content. Okay. We'll go back here. How do I get out of this? Do I go? <laughs> okay. Um, I go to, do I, hit start broadcast right yes yeah there we go then i exit out of that and then i go here and now can you see that yes beautiful yes. tower place oh, yay yes. so this, so, yeah so this is tower place um this photo was taken in 2016. um you can see um some lights on in that building and um and, you know it's it's all glass it's all glass. So, and he, here's one I took this week. You know, you can barely, I mean, you can, but it's, you can see it's the same color as the rest of the sky, you yeah. know? Yeah, that one uh, building on the right there, especially, is, is the same color as the clouds, isn't it? Yeah, that is the Fifth Third Bank building that's right on Peachtree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. okay. Was that this, the Swiss Hotel on the right in that last photo? Uh, no, this photo, no, it's, um, the part of the terminus building complex. Yeah. I am not cool because I have not been up there in so long. My half of these right, buildings are new. Right on, um, it's on, uh, Piedmont actually. Gotcha. So the perspective here is hard to tell. Yeah. Um, the building on the far right is on Piedmont. Okay. Whereas the building, the second from the right is, uh, you access it from Peachtree. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is up uh, near Lenox Square, um, looking um, south on Peachtree as the sun is coming up. And you can see how the sun reflects off of that bright building in yeah. the middle there. I can't remember what building that is. That's another oh, interesting you know, thing. The, that's yeah. the Westin, actually. It's actually, um, it's yes. actually just south of Lenox Square. You know, that's interesting too. I never thought of that because at my home in Virginia Highlands here, we have so many, you know, the little high rises, mixed use things going up that we can see three different sunrises now every morning. So the birds get confused by that too, I guess. Maybe, maybe they do. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and then this is the little building. It's, um, I think it's um, a bb and building. It's just north of the financial center on Peach Street. Um, and I've got two pictures of it here, but you can see, I mean, that, that the side of that building looks just like those pink clouds in, yeah. in the sky there. And then this is that building from the front with the, what's now the Waldorf Astoria. It used to be the Mandarin Oriental reflected in the front of that building. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've walked into uh, doors at uh, big box retailers before thinking they were open. <laughs> and, yeah. and they weren't. Uh, so yeah. I see that Adam just checked in. Let me make sure he can stick around for a minute or two. Adam, do you have time to stay with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay, uh, Mary is telling us about your wonderful project, Safe Flight, and we're just going over some things that she's doing. So if Great. it's okay, hang around with us for a few minutes and then we're going to get some input from you. And thank you for joining us, Adam Betchel with uh, Georgia Audubon. Sure. Okay, and then this building is the financial center. Um, right. It straddles uh, 400 um, 
on, it's on the east side of Peachtree, it straddles 400. And this is, this is one corner of that building. Oh my goodness, uh, look at that. And then this corner is just, uh, it's deadly. Um, right below, there's some stairs that come down from the left from Peachtree. And then we walk around the back of the building and then walk into um, the courtyard there. But this, this corner of this building, right. it, it, I've found several species of thrushes and numerous species of warblers here that have died from hitting um, those windows. Um, and so this is kind of our process here. This is, um, I took this picture while I was walking the perimeter of Tower Place. You can actually walk right at the base of that building all, mm. almost all the way around it, uh, about three quarters of the way around it. One side's like a parking garage and it's not accessible. But we walk around the base of these buildings or, and, and peek into the shrubbery and um, look for uh, birds that have been victims of uh, window strikes. Um, so this is another picture at Tower Place. This was taken on Wednesday. This is my husband, Gavin. You can barely see it there, but right at the base of that building is a dead um, common yellowthroat. Oh, no. um, yeah, so I see it, just that little tiny yellow spot down there underneath the column. A little tiny yellow spot. And you can wow. see gas reflected there. And there's also uh, trees there. Um, so, yeah. you know, some of these birds may, may have hit, may have been in the process of migration and hit the really tall building and died. Or they could have come in at dawn and had been bouncing around in those trees there or in that shrubbery um, <laughs> and um, they uh, confuse the reflection in the glass for another tree. And I'm going to get Adam to comment on that too because it seems like it's always a rare bird, you know. Um, well, um, it's, it's mostly migrants. It's um, a most of the birds that, well, we only go during migration, but I'm always doing an e-bird list of the birds we see in here, of mm. mockingbirds and cardinals and robins and um, Carolina wrens, um, but very rarely do we find one of those birds dead. Yeah, um, I guess because they grew up here and they're used to the surroundings or something, I don't know. Yeah, but how did they grow up? Not, without being killed, yeah. <laughs> without being killed. Um, maybe we need to do this during breeding season, I don't know. But um, the, um, anyway, so what Gavin is doing, I, I've, I have finished, I you do the, the app part and Gavin does the paperwork. He's filling out a little <laughs> slip of paper that right. tells tells where we found the bird, um, if we have photos, and then he, uh, he picks it up. Oh, and I love no. Gavin, by the way, every time I see you, uh, Gavin is backing you up somehow and he never, <laughs> he never talks and he's a very polite and friendly person. So it's, it's always a treat when you guys come up like at Lake Lanier last week and there's Gavin and he's taking care of business. And, and yep. I think that's a great <laughs> thing. We had uh, Rebecca and Dwayne Seelan on here a couple of weeks ago that, and they're a married couple that also bird all the time. I think that's a wonderful thing, and you're very lucky to have that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we each have our own interests, but this is a, an interest that we uh, we share. So we have our, our mutual hobby, and then we have our own hobbies. But um, he he's there. He's uh, collecting the data and um, putting it on a piece of paper, and he will put that little bird in a Ziploc bag, and um, we keep them in our freezer until such time as we take them over to the Blue Heron uh, uh, Nature Preserve, uh, where Adam has a Adam has a freezer there that um, uh, we have a permit. Uh, the project has a permit from both the Fish and Wildlife Service and Georgia DNR to be able to collect specimens because it's illegal to to collect bird feathers or right. uh, a protected species. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that and they think they're yeah. doing the right thing, you know, but they're really kind of hampering the research. Right. But I mean, it's, I mean, in general, when you're out in the woods, if you find something dead, leave it there, right. you know, it, unless you have a permit to collect it. Right. Uh, that's, that's the, the legal part of it. But we do have permits. And so we um, collect these in a, in a little Ziploc bag and then give them to Adam. Um, 
this is a heartbreaking scene we came upon um, just this Wednesday, day before yesterday, at a little building. This is a little three-story building at near the corner of Lenox Road and Piedmont Road. Right. Um, and uh, we came around the corner. It was the first building uh, on our route on Wednesday. We don't always do the route the same way, but um, we do the complete route, but we don't always start at the same place. Um, these, those yellow circles on the left are three Tennessee warblers. Oh, wow. And the one on the right up there on the little ledge, you can see Gavin bending over. It was still, the sun wasn't quite up. Um, he's, oh, it's a American red start. Oh. Um, and, <laughs> and on Monday, when we were at this building, we came around the corner and in that um, landscape bed there, there were um, three theories. Wow. Um, and uh, so this I think is, I saw that video on Facebook, right? Do you, you mentioned something no, about that? No, that was a, a live one. I'll talk about that okay. one a little bit. Okay. That was last week. But this, this, these were all dead birds. Right. Um, so um, I was chatting with Adam about this yesterday. I mean, most likely these birds came in um, to the left there, off, off to the side of where this photograph is, there are some trees. And you can see some trees back there in the back. Um, these birds likely came in as um, their nighttime migration was ending and uh, were bouncing around in those trees. And as the sun started to come up, um, they saw a tree over here on the right that was a reflection. Um, um, so that's, I mean, we weren't there to see it, so we don't know exactly what happened, but I mean, this is not a tall building. They probably already ended their migration and for some reason they flew at that window. Um, so that, that's, it's a heartbreaking way to start the day. I mean, the yeah. hard thing about this is that you're out there, you're looking for something you don't really want to see. Right. Um, but um, that's why I like to go out and do some real birding or help at banding stations and stuff because yeah. I get to see yeah. and handle live birds. Um, I get rather that, than, yeah. In my rescue rather, experience, it's been very heartbreaking. So it's, yeah. you know, you have to balance it out by enjoying the live ones too. But it's right. an important thing you're doing. And, you know, um, that's why we got you on to show you, you know, some of the other things besides just running out and having a good day birding. Right. And, and this is, this is the corner of that building. You can see it's, yeah. You know, you can see the trees reflected in there. The top window is you can see yeah. the blue sky. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks just like the surroundings, like it's not even there. And Adam can probably tell us a little something about that later too. Yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is the continuation of the process, the Ziploc bag with the bird and the data card in it. Uh, this is, this is um, what I shared on Facebook last week that prompted this whole event today, <laughs> Stephen. This is, um, a northern water thrush. Um, this and, and when Adam was teaching me about this, uh, teaching me this route, um, this is where we found this bird. Uh, this is a pano shot uh, with my iPhone that I took um, on Monday of this of this place. It's a uh, atrium, um, but it's an open air atrium. To my back, it's open. Above is glass. And you can see on three sides of this is glass. And probably what happened with this um, little northern water thrush is that um, she landed in some trees that are outside and um, then got into this um, uh, atrium and she had exhausted herself or he uh, just by like flying into that, into that window. Um, so yeah, that bird um, looks like it's still alive, you know, like it's just, oh yeah, she is sitting she in is. your hand waiting to fly. Yeah. yeah, this, um, it was very much alive and oh. Oh. yeah, this <laughs> is bad. one, this is one of the live ones from last week. Okay. Uh, I'm so heartbroken of so, that last photo. I guess I'm, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is, uh, he, she's still alive. Um, so we, um, uh, put her in a paper bag. I have a picture of another bird in a paper uh -huh. bag. So the dead ones we put in plastic bags, the live ones we put in paper bags, and we carry them the rest of the route. Um, 
with them bouncing around in there. Um, uh, so anyway, this, this is a northern water thrush. This is where it got trapped and I was able to pick her up, pick it up. Um, this is the same day. This is over at Tower Place. This is a, the Viri. You can see this bird is um, still alive, but um, this is a really how that bird really looked. It was, it, you can see its eyes are- Not happy not happy it was dazed um it wasn't bouncing around it was just sitting there so i could just walk up and pick it up and you know, i was surprised to see how many people just walked by these birds when i would see them you know uh, yeah like people just walk by and don't even care you know yeah <laughs> even yeah. if the bird is struggling or something they'll just you know who cares right um it always bothered me a lot yeah yeah i think people don't know what to do yeah yeah yeah, but um, so anyway, we uh, took these two birds uh, to our reha uh, rehabber named Nancy Eileen. I know Nancy. And she um, she um, gave these birds a um, a round of anti-inflammatory uh, medication, and uh, the next day. Um, she said that they uh, tried to escape when she was weighing them. So she decided it was time to release them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, somebody posted on Facebook last week um, on Saturday or Sunday that Nancy, uh, Eileen and Joy Carter took this, these two birds, the Northern water thrush and this Veery and um, an American red start that Nancy had gotten a day or two before over to Constitution Lakes and sent them on their way. Yeah, we, we, Nancy's a friend of our nonprofit as well. And we, we actually sponsor her for the last couple of years. Whenever we do our fundraiser, we give a significant portion to theirs, you know, cause they're the only licensed songbird rehabbers in the metro area, as far as I know. Yeah. So, right. Good place. Right. Yeah. She's really great. Adam, are you still doing good on time? Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. I like, I'm, I'm traveling to the coast right now, so I'm just yeah. pulling off and yeah, enjoying. So you need a rest. Uh, how much are you learning from Mary? Has this been a learning experience from you? For you? <laughs> <laughs> it's been great you know mary and gavin are you know really committed volunteers not only to this program but so much of what we do at george audubon so i have definitely learned from them in the past and and you know i'm always excited to have their commitment and and if you give gavin a wee bit of scotch he opens up a little bit <laughs> that's the trick huh i'll have to remember that <laughs> so. well good so i appreciate you hanging around with us adam and uh, you yeah. probably need a break from driving so yeah. make some kind of signal if you have to go though okay all right so i want to go back to a, a, a picture this picture what I, i've been doing this for about four four and a half years and when adam uh, took me through this atrium. He said, um, you know, I'm just concerned that a bird would get, get in here and get trapped. So mm -hmm. let's, you know, um, I've designed this route to check behind all these potted plants and stuff like that. And, <clears throat> the, you know, so I've always faithfully done it, but the, uh, last Friday was the first time that I, that I've actually, that we, I or we have ever actually found a bird in there. Maybe other volunteers have, but, um, so I was glad that we kept to the kept to the route and found that little um, northern water thrush in there, just like Adam thought that that might happen. Um, this is a, a little winter wren uh, from this was uh, uh, 2016 um, that I found at uh, Tower Place, and this this bird's alive. Here's a little video. Can you see, is the video yes. working for you? Yes, yeah, so I was not able to capture this bird. I was taking a little video and trying to get close to it. It's like a little brown golf ball on legs. Right. And there, and there it goes. It, yeah. it flew off um, without um, any... Um, so it was any, just stunned briefly. And, and it was uh, it had been stunned briefly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, um, this is a common yellow throat that um, I found at um, the financial center um, several years ago that um, I ended up releasing on the spot because its wings seem to be working okay. Right. Um, so um, sometimes, sometimes we um, can do an assessment on the spot and decide that this bird looks okay. It looked, its eyes were bright, its wings worked. 
so I let it go there. I, I wish now that I'd put put it in a bag and taken it to somewhere safer. I regret mm -hmm. that, um, but um, it did fly off um, very um, very well. Um, this is a white-throated sparrow that I found at Tower Place, um, and um, I put it in a paper bag. <laughs> and this is at a in a in a restroom on my route when I stopped for a break. <laughs> and as you can see, it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it makes me laugh every time. So um, anyway, I um, took that bird to Adam and he took it, I think he took it over to um, Blue Heron and released it. Um, it was, um, it was obviously doing very well hopping around in that right. bag. Um, this is a video. This is, um, you can see, that's a Northern Cardinal. Oh, no. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. Um, Just flew right into that building. Yeah, this is at the Financial Center. And for three weeks in a row, or three, three sessions in a row last fall, I took a video of this bird, this, uh, the same Northern Cardinal. I assume it's the same Northern Cardinal. Right. Sitting in this, in this um, I think it's some kind of cedar or evergreen or something. Chirping. So he's warding off his his uh, his male uh, competitors, right? Like they do right. on, the, on your side right. view mirrors on your car when you park it in the driveway and all that. Right. Well, yeah, but he thinks, yeah, here's, yeah. He, he thinks that it's um, he's exhausting himself right. doing it. You right. know, and will eventually um, die from it. Yeah. So I wanted to talk next a little bit about um, what uh, what you can do because a lot of a lot of the the data shows that a lot of window strikes, I mean, we blame these tall buildings and these corporate spaces and they are bad and we need to do something to reduce light pollution, but there's things that individual homeowners can do as well. And this is um, here at our house. Um, this is what I tried to show you the other day, Stephen, right. uh, when we were practicing, but I decided to take photos that would be better. This is on a rainy day yesterday. You can see those little dots on the window. Yeah. That's, um, we've applied that to the sliding glass doors to our deck. That's um, these feather friendly dots. And if you go to the Atlanta Audubon website and go to the conservation tab. Georgia Audubon, right. Georgia Audubon, <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. Uh, you can, uh, there's a link there. Um, to oh, these are pretty easy to apply also. You can order them from that site, but this, these are strips, right? It's not just little dots. It's a little strip. Well, right. there, it, it comes in strips, but when you peel it off, all that remains are these dots. Right. I got you. Um, so, so they're not difficult to put on and they save birds. They save birds. And then the other thing we've done on some windows that are too high in our house to, uh, for us to get safely up. I, I, I don't let Gavin climb ladders anymore. <laughs> yeah, me I don't heard, let me climb ladders anymore. <laughs> I, I, uh, I've heard too many stories. Um, right. So we, um, we made these things. You can order these, but you can also make them yourself. They're called Acopian bird savers. Mm -hmm. And you get some J molding from um, uh, Lowe's and some paracord and you drill holes every four inches in the J molding and you uh, uh, tie knots in the end of the paracord and insert it through that holes. And then mm. we had a, a guy that does some contracting work for us, hang these up. Um, and so um, our feeders, it actually, you can see the hummingbird feeder there, mm. but right now we've suspended our regular seed feeding operation because we had a breakout of conjunctivitis. Yeah, yeah, it's that time. In our house finches and our cardinals. So we stopped feeding for a while, but um, So this these, breaks up the view for the bird. It breaks up the view. And yeah. even though our feeders are only, feeders should be less than three feet or greater than 30 feet from your window to minimize bird strikes. But we still had birds thumping into the window when they, right. when they were arguing and fighting over a position on the feeder and they would take off and, you know, they'd hit the window. They weren't, because they're, they're, they don't have enough time to build up a mo enough momentum to injure themselves, it was really disconcerting right. anyway, and it could happen. So we put these up. 
and it's been amazing how many fewer thumps we hear. Um, yeah. And actually, some of the birds come and they perch on the side of these um, ropes sometimes. Yeah. Um, now, we use uh, screens. I have a three-story home, and, and I, I, I am thinking that I'm doing the best thing by having screens on all my windows and also by keeping my blinds closed 99% of the time. How do you, how would you tell the average homeowner, you know, is that okay? Should I be doing more? Um, but, I can chime well, in unless you want to take it, Mary. No, you go ahead. I think you'll be better. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure the answer to so, that. So old school, you know, not old school, but you know, those insect screens that you have, Stephen, are, are yeah. amazing. They're great for birds. They're not going to hurt themselves if there's screens on the outside. Um, Mary did a great job talking about feather friendly and there, there's other film products like that that you can put up that have dots or very narrow, very thin strips, you know, vertically or horizontally. Uh, the Ecopian bird savers, you can, like Mary said, they have a do it yourself breakdown on their website. You can also just buy some similar type cord off Amazon and put it up. Um, you know, even if you just want to do it for a month out of the year when it's the worst, you know, like late right. September, October right now, and then again, late April. Have your kids, you know, draw with fake snow or paint your windows for a month, you know, and then wash it off. So right. ideally you would do something like, like Mary and Gavin have done, but there are, are many, many things you can do. The two key things are um, spacing. So you can see on the photo right now, if you can see Mary's photo with the uh, Acopian cords dangling, you want something spaced four inches apart horizontally like that or closer. Um, and then if you do it vertical stripes, you want two inches apart. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the rough dimensions of a small songbird, like some of these mm -hmm. warblers we're seeing, mm -hmm. that's about how big they are when they're flying. Four inch, you know, four inches wide, mm -hmm. a couple inches tall. So um, you can be very well-meaning, but only have one or two little decals on your window. And mm -hmm. more than likely the birds will just try to go around them. So yeah, well, I was thing, thinking I was doing the right thing here. We, we've, I've lived here for 29 years and I've never once found a bird yeah. uh, dead from that. Mary, is it okay with you if Adam uh, gives us a little talk since he's on the side of the road and then we'll come Absolutely. back? Absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> so Adam, what's this all about, I, this man? Is pr this is pretty much ends the, the photos that I had to share, so. Well, great, if you um, wouldn't mind then, we'll let Adam get back on the road after we uh, squeeze some information out of him. Um, okay. Adam Betchwell is uh, with Georgia Audubon and uh, he's the man. Uh, we, I'm real grateful that you that you could spend some time with us, um, Adam. And I saw Adam yesterday morning at Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve birding with his beautiful daughter uh, while we were watching the uh, the bittern. So yeah. uh, the what's bittern, up, Adam? The marsh wren and I got a blue winged warbler. So a couple of new oh, counties awesome. for the year for me. So that was good. Um, yeah, so not much. I, I'm like I said, I'm driving down from Atlanta to the Georgia coast, and I was just trying to find somewhere somewhat quiet to, to talk to you all. And there's an eBird hotspot nearby, but I pulled in <laughs> to this building instead. It's a relatively generic looking suburban office park. And you can tell from behind me, it's highly reflective. And these are the types of buildings and the type of glass and glazing that is so common and our kind of aesthetic preference right now. And unfortunately, that's not good for birds. So cut me off if I'm repeating what Mary might have said at the beginning, but you know, bird building collisions is the third leading cause of bird death in our country, unfortunately. So behind habitat loss, which is kind of obvious and, and massive, and then outdoor cats, uh, bird building collisions comes in at number three, and it's somewhere between 365 million to 1 billion birds a year. So on the low end, we're talking about a million birds a day. On that average. is startling. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the reason there's a, a large variance there is historically the data that's been collected has been done by well-meaning volunteer groups and Audubon chapters, but it, it hasn't been collected in a way with just some basic effort statistics where it could be extrapolated a bit better. So that's why it's still trying to be fine-tuned fine to get a, a better estimate. But again, even on the low end, it's a huge, huge number. Um, so yeah, we've had Project Safe Flight for almost five years now, and that's, you know, the volunteer kind of boots on the ground wing of, of the program to determine what species are hitting, how many birds, what part of town, and then we're trying to take that information to start doing things about it. So our first step was to create a Lights Out program, so if you're not familiar with that, you should look it up on the Georgia Audubon website. We're just asking people to take a pledge um and that by reducing your lighting at home or at work or using you know if you're nervous about your place being too dark use a motion sensor or a timer if you can 
uh, or at least just make sure your lights are down shielded so that the light's not going up to the to the sky because many of our migrating songbirds fly at night and there's lots of evidence to show that they are confused and attracted by our urban glow or our suburban glow of, of light pollution and that pulls them into these glass covered you know urban centers or, or neighborhoods that we have and to address the glass we've been able to retrofit i think it's seven buildings now uh through some grant funding with one more coming later this year and hopefully some more in the next couple of years and we had our first new project that we were a part of at the candida building for innovative sustainable design on georgia tech's campus which actually employs bird friendly glass so it's not a film or something you put up after the fact it's actually embedded in the glass and can really? signal to the birds this is not a safe flyway. This reflection is not what you think it is. And for those interested, I'm putting up the links to whatever Adam's talking about on our uh, live broadcast comment section. Um, so did, did you, I'm, I'm guessing you walked around that building a little bit to see if there were any birds. I did, I did. And, <laughs> and I, I was, I felt pretty confident I was going to find one um, just doing a quick sweep, but I uh -huh. did not luckily. But while oh, Mary goodness. was talking, I did have a couple of red eyed vireos come in. So, Again, I am a stone's throw from 75. I'm right. across from the Days Inn and at some random office park, and there are mm. migrant birds right here in these trees. Mm. Uh, and so you can understand, you know, how this stuff happens. And as Mary mentioned, the best estimates we have, these high-rise buildings, they kill a lot per building, but there aren't that many. You know, how many 20-story buildings are there across Georgia? compared to these small office parks, compared to homes. Right. So high-rise buildings are thought to, to account for less than 5% of all the collisions that are mm -hmm. occurring, with 40-some percent occurring at homes and just over 50% at, at these types of buildings behind me, these low-rise buildings. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a misconception about the program that everyone thinks it's all high-rises, but it's, it's anything. Right. And, 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 and I think that they'll continue to be an issue if, you know, if we continue to urbanize and have these mega, you know, big – big cities and more urban sprawl, they, they definitely play a major role. Um, but your home is, you know, it might not account for as many, but think about how many homes there are out there and yeah. it kind of adds up to a big number. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big issue. It's mainly a migration, but birds absolutely hit throughout the year. It just makes a lot more sense. We have a lot more birds passing through um, a given space during migration, mm -hmm. more birds that could be affected by nocturnal light. If you want to see a drastic example of how nocturnal light can affect these birds. The Tribute and Lights, the 9-11 Memori Memorial in New York City, they shoot bright beams of light um, into the sky. And unfortunately for the birds, September 11th happens to be during fall migration. And so there's a research paper that came out and you can find this on the All About Birds website or Cornell. When those lights are off on a given night, so this was in 2015, the lights were off and within a half kilometer of those lights, there were 500 birds. Good and after grief. the lights had been on for 20 minutes, there were 16,000 birds in the same space. Good Lord. So that's an extreme example, um, but it shows you how they're attracted to lights and how, you know, the I had never even thought of that. That's, that's another startling number, right? You're really depressing. Yeah. I'm not sure if I should have had you on or not. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, good, the good thing is Cornell and New York City Audubon and Audubon New York and other partners have worked with the Tribute Lights, and when they can count 1,000 birds stuck in the beams, they do cut the lights. Uh -huh. The birds almost instantly will, you know, fly away, but then they turn back on and, and more come. So luckily it's not. Um, do you, you know, do you know whether they thought about the wavelengths of light they were using in that study and whether uh, since it, you know, since full white is very natural occurring light, was, there, was that ever addressed? It, it has been looked at a little bit, and I believe, um, some of the warmer, you know, I know that that like, you know, the blue LED, you know, that kind of messes with our circadian rhythms is also not ideal for birds. Uh -huh. I'm not as familiar with it. I know that I believe the warmer lights um, are, are better for birds because that's a big issue now too, that lots of people are converting to LEDs and that's yeah. great for energy savings. It's just, yeah, getting the right amount of lumens and hue and things well, like that. We have that. them here in our, our street and it looks like a UFO is landing every time yeah. you pass one. I mean, it's so bright, you can't see anything. Right. And it's right. ruined astronomy, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, we haven't done, besides our Lights Out program, we haven't done a ton of the lighting yet, but there are other groups. Uh, Portland Audubon, for example, is working a lot with the Dark Skies Initiative um, because there's a lot of overlap uh, between, you know, things that interest, you know, mm. you and, and your nonprofit and people who love birds also. 
Hey, uh, we spoke a little bit ago about um, false sunrises. Uh, like around my house, there's so many new buildings that you can see the sunrise on three different buildings and in reality behind us now. Do you have any idea about the effects that may have on birds or have you ever thought anything about that? You know, it's like you're lo looking at the sunrise on the opposite side of the sky. Yeah. You no, know, I hadn't thought about that, to be honest with you. Um, that's interesting. Okay. I, I, you know, this is different, but you do hear, especially I'm sure where you are, Stephen, and I live in an apartment complex, you know, it's bright enough that you have Carolina Wrens and American Robins and Northern Mockingbirds singing it, you know, all throughout the night because, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, confusion there. And there's we have a few other things singing throughout the night in my neighborhood, <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if that has, if that's been looked at or if that has an effect, um, you know, the sunrise appearing to come from multiple locations and, and things like that. I'm not sure. Um, well, Adam, you know, I, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for all your knowledge. And I know I'm, I'm a smart ass sometimes and a little rough around the edges, but you know, you are one of my favorite people in the world. And I am so grateful that you were with Georgia Audubon. They should immediately triple your pay, Adam. I'm putting that out <laughs> online right now. I'll make sure because, they see this. Because you uh, are the man. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really grateful that you, uh, really, I mean, everybody who mentions Georgia Audubon, eh, Adam Betchel, you know, Dottie Head, Mel, there's, there's these three, these key figures that are Georgia Audubon and you are one of them, my friend. And I'm really grateful. And um, I, unfortunately, you don't have your beautiful daughter with you to show us, but she <laughs> is really growing fast. <laughs> so, well, I, I really appreciate it, Stephen, and, and I'm very lucky. You know, we've had uh, some rapid growth at Georgia Audubon. You know, Mary had the slip of a tongue of Atlanta Audubon earlier. That's only been about a month now that we've been going statewide. But um, we have a really tight core you and do. I think a really good culture uh, amongst our employees. And it's, I think, made it easier for us to kind of carve out the path. Uh, as an organization. And I noticed you're wearing your Georgia Audubon shirt also. I I so that's new, all three of us. I got my new <laughs> it's like a cult. <laughs> We're very proud of our new logo and, and color scheme, at least I am. So it, it's good. working out well. And I'm always happy to talk more about collisions. I mean, I, I often give an hour long talk on this and could go for more. So well, we put a link up to your uh, sleepless flight uh, video, which was extraordinarily well done by professionals, uh, Jeremy and his friends. And that link is in our comment section now. And I'd strongly encourage you to go watch this. This is a fantastic video uh, with great camera work, by the way, that was shot concerning Project Safe Flight. Yeah, they did a great job. They, um, I can't remember how that started off. Maybe he just reached out to me and said this was a topic he was interested in and it kind of morphed even more into uh, the bird focus. I think he started with just light pollution and then yeah. Jeremy was really interested in, in the bird aspect. But It's a very well done video. Yeah. He, he does a great job. And we, um, we have a new uh, short PSA commercial type video that he did for us that we should be releasing soon, uh, which is also pretty exciting. Um, cool. But yeah, this is a, a really depressing uh, topic, as Mary mentioned. I mean, you, you go out looking for these birds and you're disappointed if you don't find one because you feel like, well, why did I just, you know, spend a couple hours walking around Buckhead or downtown or Dunwoody or whatever. But then when you do find it, you're instantly saddened yeah and um <laughs> yeah it, it, it's a complicated thing but the good thing is we're, we we know more and more about how to fix it there's yeah. more and more of a market of products yeah. uh, both commercial and residential that are available it's getting cheaper the big thing that a lot of cities are starting to do and something that i hope to start initiating next year is legislation or ordinance for new construction it's really not that expensive or that difficult for building a, you know, a new building like over my shoulder with acid etching in the glass or with UV yeah. pattern in the glass. So that's something really cool. Birds can see in the UV spectrum and we humans can't. Yeah. So there's actually glass products that are transparent to us, but birds, most birds can pick up patterns within the glass. So there's really creative ways to, to right. do this. It they doesn't are tetrachromatic. Yeah. yeah, we do not need concrete blocks of buildings for them to be bird safe. There are very glass heavy examples of structures that aren't killing our birds. So a little innovation and a little pre-planning, you can save billions of birds. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mary, did you have uh, anything for uh, Adam? Well, and also it's not necessary to cut down the trees to, to improve things for birds either. If you treat your, if you do something to retrofit your windows, you can still have your trees and all the benefits that they provide for people and for birds, you know, and we can, and we can live in harmony. Um, that, that would be really ideal. Yeah. 
Well, getting involved is the first step, and this is key research. Depressing, yes, but key to the continuation of, of you know, the effort. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for uh, for chiming in with us. I'm very grateful as always. Did you have any anything else, sir? Feel free. I mean, if anyone's watching and wants to learn more, or they want to volunteer. I mean, um, we're looking all over the state now for these collisions. Even if you can only give us, you know, once a week, once a month, I I'll take it. Um, we have all sorts of ways to report the findings. We have the formal app that Mary mentioned that our volunteers use, but we also use a website called DBird for those incidental findings. So, you know, Steven shot me photos before of birds he's found on the belt line or close to his house. If you happen to go to Kroger one day and find a bird, I, I want to know about it. Um, so even so, a, a standard birder that sees a bird, it's a value to you. To absolutely. Yeah. So that dbird.org slash ATL, that's also going to be linked on our website. And we're, we're working with the, the folks who have created and run that platform. It started with New York City Audubon, and we were a pilot site for them. They're revamping that. It's going to become a nationwide open source type thing. So it's a, it, you know, it still has our old name and logo, but in the coming months, it'll be updated and I think really exciting. And there's so, even another program you could check out. It's called the Global Bird Rescue. It's put on by our Canadian friends at Bird Safe Canada, the group FLAP, which stands for Fatal Light Awareness Program. They've done, they're really leading this initiative up there, them and the American Bird Conservancy. But from uh, October 5th to 11th, they're trying people to report as many collisions as they can via their map, just to get a global snapshot during peak migration across the, or across the world. So again, let me know, but check that out too, if you want to learn more about the issue or, or if you want to participate in their week-long program. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and drive safely and try not to be staring through your binoculars much while you're driving. I've been on trips and seen what you do. My, my wife gives me a hard time. I, I, I try to not bird and drive, but it's, it's, it's tricky sometimes for me. It, it never turns off. Um, but yeah, I'll be on the coast for a couple of days, hopefully finding some exciting shorebirds and migrant warblers. and, and American other. bittern, American bittern, American Maybe. bittern. I'll, I'll be going to Fowler, Fowler, Fowler. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Adam. I need, I need those fellows in Georgia. You're All welcome. right, buddy. I appreciate yeah. you, man. Bye-bye. Yep. See you, everyone. All right, that was a visit from everyone's best friend, Adam uh, Betchwell with Georgia Audubon. And uh, we're gonna hand it back over to Miss Mary Kimberly to tell us a little more about what she's doing. Oh, well, oh, okay. Was that the end of your presentation? <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, I mean, I had a few, a picture of a statue and some other things that we found down there that aren't bird related, but. <laughs> I got you. Um, did anyone on the Zoom meeting have anything they wanted to chime in and, and yell at me about or uh, speak to Miss Kimberly, Mrs. Kimberly? Hey, Talk there's Alexander. Kimberly. Alexander's <laughs> in the UK and she's a good friend of the program. How you doing, Alexander? Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, just the day before yesterday, I had a nut hatch that flew into my window. Um, and it's difficult to know what is best to do. Obviously, I checked around and made sure that there were no cats about. Um, but is it best to just leave them so that they don't get panicked? And I just watched him for 20 minutes until he slowly started to recover. Um, or is it better to actually hold them and keep them warm? Which is the best? It's this is best. assuming they weren't killed by the, by the collision, yeah. but they're still struggling to survive. Yeah, yeah. It's best to put them in a dark um, box, uh, maybe, uh, you know, where, the, where that's a loosely covered box where they can still get oxygen and air, but um, it, to let them, or, you know, like in our program, we put them in a paper bag um, and put them in a dark, cool, um, not too cold place, but, um, and uh, check on them in an hour or two and then uh, release them. Don't, don't try to feed them. Don't, don't try to give them water. Um, because you don't know what's going on internally with them and whether they can handle that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just um, take them out, take them into a safe place and then check on them later. And if they, if you open the bag or the box and they fly away, great. If not, then um, maybe try to find um, somebody who can do some rehab work with them. Well, I've noticed that every animal, uh, Alexander, that, that I take in after like, rescuing them in the field, I'll take it to the vet or whatever. The first thing they always do is put it in a dog crate or a feet or some kind of box to isolate it in a dark area and don't do anything to it and just leave it alone to kind of get de-stressed. 
So, well, yeah, because um, sometimes if you pick them up and things like that, they get more stress. Oh, yeah, they do not so like to be worry picked about up. That. <laughs> I mean, you know, we know we're trying to help. They think we're trying to eat them. So yeah, it's just more stress to a horrible situation. Um, so Alexander, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something that's been on my mind for a while. Um, you know, we love to listen to you talk because you have a great accent. <laughs> what does it sound like when you listen to us talk? Is it great or is it just like, oh, those, those are, you know, colonists. They're, is it horrible? Because uh, I know when I was in Australia, people would stop me and want me just to talk to them because of my Southern male accent. They just loved it, man. And that's how we feel about the English accent. So how do the English feel about the American accent? Um, I think that you just sound um, just normal, actually. Um, <laughs> because I think we watch so, so many American TV programs that we're just so used to it that it just sounds natural. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's good. Um, we watch so many BBC America shows that you, you are beginning to sound natural to me, but uh, I have had friends uh, that have checked on with the accent that I couldn't understand a single word they were saying. And, uh, you know, I think that's an odd thing. So, Mary, yeah. uh, My husband is from Scotland, and when we watch um, BBC programs, Masterpiece Theater, or, uh, or even the program Shetland, we put on the subtitles, it, you know, even, even <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I need them, but sometimes he needs them too. <laughs> well, Mary and there Alexander. There are some accents that definitely yes. need subtitles. Yes. Richard Bailey, our old friend, Richard Bailey, who's not with us anymore, had an accent like that. I could not understand a word he was saying, but I loved him just the same. Um, <laughs> so on Sunlit Earth's Facebook page, we have photos from all over the world. We have bird, wildlife, sun photos from everywhere. And Alexander is a, a contributor there. And she's got a beautiful garden uh, and she has all the birds come up that we think, you know, the robin. Well, it's not our robin. It's their kind of robin or the tit or the nuthatch. So I would uh, recommend going there and checking out some of Alexander's photos uh, mm -hmm. because they're awesome and she's awesome. And thank you, Alexander, for, for being on board with us again this week. You're the greatest. Uh, okay. Mary Kimberly, um, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you coming on uh, the show. It's a depressing but essential program and you know people like you that that do this work uh you know you don't understand it until you go out and do it and it's just it's very similar to bird, bird and animal rescue you know it's it's essential but it's not the happiest thing uh to do so i i and i'm sure all of our viewers uh, appreciate you taking the time to do this oh you're welcome I'm, I'm glad it was fun i'm glad i did it well thank you for being on um next week's broadcast did you have anything else uh, Mary? No, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and you have a beautiful home, by the way. Your garden is lovely and uh, you're, you're doing great there. So um, next week's program, as always, we don't even, we don't have any idea who's going to be on it. You know, whoever comes up and does something awesome during the week next week is going to be on the program. So maybe Wes Hatch. Uh, I'm not sure who it is, but I ran into Mary and uh, Gavin looking for that dang frigate bird at Lake Lanier that I could never find. But they came up and were kind and we had a conversation and I said, you know, she should be on the show because she's very interesting. So thanks again. And oh, we, we will see you Friday at 10 a.m. on the uh, Sunlit Earth Facebook page. And to all the Georgia Audubon viewers on their page, thank you so much for tuning in. And go join Georgia Audubon if you're not a member because it's an awesome group. And you too can get a cool t-shirt like this. And we will see you next week. And that's it for this week in Sunlit Earth. Goodbye.